The Beautiful Galriche by Geoffrey Ford His facial fur was a swirling wonder of blonde and blue with highlights the deep orange of the November sun. It covered every inch of his brow and cheeks, the blunt ridge of his nose, even his eyelids. When beset by a bow of overwhelming sympathy, he would twirl the thicket of longer strands that sprouted from the center of his forehead. His bright silver eyes emitted invisible beams that penetrated the most guarded demeanors of his patients and shed light upon the condition of their souls. Discovering the essence of an individual, the Gelrish would sit quietly, staring, tapping the black enamel nails of his hirsute hands together in an incantatory rhythm that would regulate the heartbeat of his visitor to that of his own blood muscle. And when, may I ask, did you perceive the first inklings of your despair? He would say with a sudden whimper. Once his question was posed, the subject was no longer distracted by the charm of his prominent incisors. He would lick his lips once, twice, three times with diminishing speed, adjusting the initiate's respiration and brain pulse. Then, the loveliness of his pointed ears, the grace of his silk fashions would melt away, and his lucky intellectual would have no choice but to tell the truth, even if in her heart of hearts she believed herself to be lying. When my father left us, might be the answer, let us walk, my dear, the Galrish would suggest. The woman, or man, or child, as the case might be, would put a hand into the warm hand of the heart's physician. He would lead them through his antechamber into the hallway and through the back entrance of his house. To walk with the Gelrish, matching his languorous stride, was to partake in a slow, stately procession. His gentle direction would guide one down the path to the hole in the crumbling brick and mortar wall netted with ivy. Before leaving the confines of the wild garden, he might pluck a lily to be handed to his troubled charge. The path through the woods snaked in great loops around strands of oak and maple. Although the garden appeared to be at the height of summer life, this adjacent stretch of forest leading toward the sea was forever trapped in autumn. Here, just above the murmur of the wind and just below the rustle of red and yellow leaves, the Galrish would methodically pose his questions designed to fan the flames of his companion's anguish. With each troubled answer, he would respond with phrases he was certain would keep that melancholic heart drenched in a black sweat. Horrible, he would say, in the whine of a dog dreaming. My dear, that's ghastly. How can you go on? If I were you, I would be weeping was one that never failed to turn the trick. When the tears would begin to flow, he'd reach into the pocket of his loose-fitting jacket of paisley design for a handkerchief, stitched in vermilion, bearing the symbol of a broken heart. Handing it to his patient, he would again continue walking, and the gentle interrogation would resume. An hour might pass, even two, but there was no rush. There were so many questions to be asked and answered. Upon finally reaching the edge of the cliff that gave a view outward of the boundless ocean, the Gelrish would release the hand of his subject and say with tender conviction, And so, you see, the ocean must be for you as a representation of the overwhelming, intractable dilemma that gnaws at your heart. You know without my telling you that there is really only one solution. You must move toward peace to a better place. Yes, yes, thank you, would come the response followed by a fresh torrent of tears. The handkerchief would be employed, and then the Galrish would kindly ask for it back. The future lies ahead of you, and the troubled past bites at your heels, my child. Three steps forward, and the prescription would be filled. A short flight of freedom, a moment of calm for the tortured soul, and then endless rest on the rocks below, surrounded by rib cages and skulls of fellow travelers once pursued by grief and now cured. The marvelous creature would pause and dab a tear or two 
from the corners of his own eyes before undressing. Then, naked but for the spiral pattern of his body's fur, he would then walk ten paces to the east where he kept a long rope tied at one end to the base of a mighty oak growing at the very edge of the cliff. His descent could only be described as acrobatic, pointing to a history with the circus. When finally down among the rocks, he would find the corpse of the new immigrant to the country without care, and tidily devour every trace of flesh. Later, in the confines of his office, he would compose a letter in turquoise ink on yellow paper, assuring the loved ones of his most recent patient that she or he seeking the solace of a very warm sun and crystal sea, had booked passage for a two-year vacation on the island of Valshavar. A paradisiacal atoll strung like a bead on a necklace of the equator. Let not the price of this journey trouble your minds, for I, understanding the exemplary nature of the individual in question, have decided to pay all expenses for their escape from torment. In a year or two, when next you meet them, they will appear younger, and in their laughter, you will feel the warmth of the tropical sun. With their touch, your own problems will vanish as if conjured away by island magic. This missive would then be rolled like a scroll, tied fast with the length of green ribbon, and given into the talon of a great horned owl to be delivered. And so, it was that the Gelrish operated from continent to continent, dispensing his exquisite pity and relieving his patients of their unnecessary mortal coils. When suspicion arose to the point where doubt began to negate his beauty in the eyes of the populace, then by dark of night he would flee on all fours, accompanied by the owl deep into the deepest forest, never to be seen again in that locale. The pile of bones he'd leave behind was undeniable proof of his treachery, but the victims' families preferred to think of their loved ones stretched out beneath a palm frond canopy on the pink beach of Valshavar, being fed peeled grapes by a monkey valet. This daydream in the face of horror would deflate all attempts at organizing a search party to hunt him down. Although he would invariably move on, setting up a practice in a new locale rich in heavy hearts and haunted minds, Something of him would remain behind in the form of a question, namely, what was the beautiful Gelrish? Granted, there were no end of accounts of his illusory form. Everything from that of a dashing cavalry officer with waxed mustache to the refined, blonde impertinence of a symphony conductor. He reminded one young woman whom he had danced with at a certain town soiree as being a blend of her father, her boss, and her older brother. In fact, when notes were later compared, not two could agree on the precise details of his splendor. He was finally captured during one of his escapes, found with his left leg in a fox trap only a mile from the village he had last bestowed his pity upon. This beast in pain could not fully concentrate on creating the illusion of loveliness, and the incredulous chicken farmer who discovered him writhing in the bite of the still jaws witnessed him shifting back and forth between suave charm and gnashing horror. The poor farmer was certain he had snared the devil. A special investigator was sent out to handle the case. Blind and somewhat autistic, the famous detective, Gal de Gui, methodically put the entire legacy together as if it was a child's jigsaw puzzle. Of course, in the moments of interrogation by de Gui, the Gal Reese tried to catch him up with his glamorous illusion. The detective responded to this deception with a yawn. The creature later told his prison guards that de Gui's soul was blank as a white wall and perfect. De Gui's final comment on the Gelrish was, Put down some newspaper and give him a bone. Here is the classic case of man's best friend. It was when the Gelrish related his own life story to the court, eliciting pity from the people who previously desired his. 
that he allowed himself to appear as the hominid canine entity that had always lurked behind his illusion. As the tears filled the eyes of the jury, his handsome visage wavered like a desert mirage and then lifted away to reveal fur and fangs. No longer were his words the mellifluous susurrations of the sympathetic therapist, but now came through his growling dog talk in a spray of spittle. Even the huge owl that sat on his shoulder in the witness stand shrunk and darkened to become a grackle. As he told it, he had been born into an aristocratic family, the name of which everyone present would have known, but he would not mention it for fear of bringing reprisals down upon them for his actions. Because of his frightening aspect to birth, his father accused his mother of bestiality. The venerable patriarch made plans to do away with his wife, but she saved him the trouble by poisoning herself with small sips of opium and an arsenic pastry of her own recipe. The strange child was named Ramo after a distant relation on the mother's side and sent to live in a newly constructed barn on the outskirts of the family estate. At the same time that the father ordered the local clergy to try and exorcise the beast out of him, there was a standing order for the caretaker to feed him nothing but raw meat. As the Gelrish had said on the witness stand, my father spent little time thinking about me, but when he did, the fact of my existence twisted his thinking so that it labored pointlessly at cross purposes. The family priest taught the young Ramo how to speak and read so that the strange child could learn the Bible. Through this knowledge of language, he was soon able to understand the holy man's philosophy, which, in brief, was that the world was a ball of shit adrift in a sea of sin, and the sooner one passed to heaven, the better. As the Gelrish confessed, he took these lessons to heart, and so later in life, when he helped free his patient's souls from extra mental bondage, he felt he was actually doing them a great favor. It was from the bald and jolly man of God, that the creature became acquainted with the power of pity. On the other hand, the caretaker who daily brought the beef was a man of the world. He was very old and had traveled far and wide. This kindly aged vagabond would tell the young Rameau stories of far-off places. Islands at the equator and tundra crowded with migrating elk, one day he told the boy of a fellow he had met in a far-off kingdom that sat along the old silk road to China. This remarkable fellow, Ibn Saudi, was his name and had the power of persuasion. With subtle movements of his body, certain tricks of respiration in accordance with that of his audience, he would make himself invincible or appear as the beautiful woman. It was an illusion, of course, but to the viewer it seemed as real as day. What was his secret? asked Rameau. The old man leaned in close to the boy's cage and whispered, Listen to the rhythm of life, and when you look, do not accept, but project. Feel what the other is feeling, and make what they have felt what you feel. Speak only their own desire to them in a calm, soft voice and they will see you as beautiful as they wish themselves to be. The Gelrish had time, days on end, to mull over his formula for control. He worked at it and tried different variations until one day he was able to look into the soul of the priest and discover what it was. A mouse, nibbling a wedge of wooden cheese. Soon after, he devised the technique of clicking together his fingernails in order to send out a hypnotic pulse. And with this, welded the power of pity to the devices of the adept from the kingdom along the old Silk Road. Imagine the innate intelligence of this boy they considered a beast. A week following, he had escaped. For some reason, the priest had opened the cage, and for his trouble, 
was found by the caretaker to have been ushered into the next and better world minus the baggage of his flesh. The jury heard the story of the Gelrish's wanderings and the perfection of his art, how he changed his name to that of a certain brand of Mediterranean cigarettes that he enjoyed. I wanted to help the emotionally wounded, he said to his accusers, and all grew sympathetic that when they vented their grief for his solitary life and saw his true form, they unanimously voted for his execution. Just prior to accepting, against his will, the thirty bullets from the rifles of the firing squad marksmen, the Galrish performed a spectacular display of metamorphosis, becoming, in turn, each of his executioners. Before the captain of the guard could shout the order of the deadly volley, the beautiful one became again himself, shouted, I feel your pain, and begged for all in attendance to participate in devouring him completely once he was dead. The final plea went unheeded. His corpse was left to the dogs and the Chiron birds. His bones were later gathered and sent to the Museum of Natural Science in the city of Nithit. The grackle was released into the wild. Once he had been disposed of and the truth had been circulated, it seemed that everyone on all continents wanted to claim some attachment to the Gelrish. For a five-year period, there was no international figure more popular. My God, the stories told about him. Women claimed to have had his children. Men claimed they were him or his brother, or at least the son of the caretaker who gave him his first clues to the protocol of persuasion. Children played Gelrish, and the lucky tyke who got to be his namesake retained for the day ultimate power in the game. An entire branch of psychotherapy was sprung up called non-consumptive Gelrishia, meaning that the therapists swamped their patients with pity but had designs not on the consumption of their flesh, merely their bank accounts. There were studies written about him, novels and plays, and an epic poem entitled Monster of Pity. The phenomenon of his popularity had given rise to a philosophical reevaluation of beauty. Gelrish mania died out in the year of the Great Comet, for here was something even more spectacular for people to turn their attention to. With the promise of the end of the world, mankind had learned to pity itself. Fortunately, or unfortunately, however one might see it, this spinning ball of shit, this paradisiacal Valshavar of planets was spared for another millennium, in which more startling forms of anomalous humanity might spring up and lend perspective to the mundane herd. And now, ages hence, recent news from Nithic concerning the Galrish. Two years ago, an enterprising graduate student from Nithic University, having been told the legends of the beautiful one when he was a child, went in search through the basement of the museum to try and uncover the box containing the creature's remains. The catacombs that lay beneath the imposing structure are vast. The records kept as to what had been stored where have been eaten by an unusual might that was believed to have been introduced into the environs of the museum by a mummy brought back from a glacier at the top of the world. Apparently, this termitic flea species awoke in the underground warmth and discovered its taste for paper, so that now... The ledgers are filled with sheets of lace, more whole than text. Still, the conscientious young man continued to search for over a year. His desire was to study the physiological form of this legend. Eventually, after months of exhaustive searching, he came upon a crate marked with grease pencil, Gelrish. Upon prying the box open, he found inside a collection of bones wrapped in a tattered garment of maroon silk. There was also a handkerchief bearing the stitch symbol of a broken heart. When he uncovered the bones, he was shocked to find the skeleton of a very large bird instead of a mutant human. 
A professor from his university determined upon inspection that those were indeed the remains of a great horned owl.